Today's video is brought to you by Audible. Go to audible.com slash company man or text company man to 500, 500 to get a free audiobook, two free Audible originals, and a 30 day free trial. Now that's a pretty sweet deal. Ben and Jerry's make some high quality ice cream, and it doesn't come cheap either. Here, oh, okay, this will be fun. Let's pretend you're on the price is right. All right, first item up for bid, this 48 ounce container of Breyers brand Snickers ice cream. Now with 10% more Snickers, you gotta keep that in mind. Is the answer in your head? Okay, actual retail price, or at least the price they charge at my local Walmart, is $3.98. Now the next and final item up for bid is this 16 ounce container of Ben and Jerry's brand Cherry Garden. Garcia. It's in your head? Okay. The price it sells for at my local Walmart is $4.28. All right. I think that's enough prices, right? I'm no Drew Carey. But think about that. The Briars container was the cheaper of the two, despite being three times larger. So how does Ben and Jerry's justify that price? And I already told you, they make some high quality ice cream. I'm not just saying that. The IDFA actually defines four qualities of ice cream. They generally have to do with the quality of ingredients and fat content and overrun of the ice cream. Overrun refers to the amount of air that's in it. Less air means less overrun and higher quality ice cream. On the low end of quality, we have economy, ice cream that meets required overrun and generally sells for a lower price than regular ice cream. Next, there is regular. Then there's premium, ice cream that tends to have low overrun and higher fat content than regular ice cream and the manufacturer uses higher quality ingredients. Then at the top, and I like this name, we have super premium, all one word, and it it means ice cream that tends to have very low overrun and high fat content. And the manufacturer uses best quality ingredients. Ben and Jerry's is categorized into this group. That's why it costs so much, and that's why it has considerably more calories than most of the others. That's their positioning in the market. They compete with all of the other ice cream brands, but their biggest concerns are the other super premium brands. haagen would be the one that stands out the most to me. Ben and Jerry's is easily one of the biggest super premium brands out there, but also just one of the biggest brands of ice cream in general. They're sold in supermarkets across the United States, they have these scoop shops all over the place, and it's sold in a bunch of other countries too. They are estimated to have the third largest share in the U.S. ice cream market. Almost 7% of all the ice cream sold in the U.S. is sold by them. So I want to talk about how they did it, how they got this big. I think this is an important story to hear because it's relatable. If you're looking to start a business or do something that just seems really big and intimidating, this is good to hear. It shows how two men who started with next to nothing and knew next to nothing can create something so big. The business goes back to 1978, and not surprising, the two men that started it were named Ben and Jerry. Ben Cohen and Jerry Greenfield, neither of which had any experience in the ice cream business. Ben was a craft teacher and Jerry was a lab technician. Neither one of them was very happy or successful in their field, but I'd say something good came of it. Do you know how Ben and Jerry's is known for all their creative names and flavors? Oat of this swirled and truffle kerfuffle and urban bourbon? Well, I'll point out how a craft teacher must possess some creativity and a lab technician must possess some science knowledge. It sounds like a good pairing to create some of these crazy ice cream flavors. But despite knowing almost nothing about ice cream and having almost no money, these two had the idea of starting an ice cream business. In an attempt to gain some kind of ice cream knowledge, College, they each paid $5 to enroll in a correspondence course about ice cream making at Penn State. A correspondence course is essentially an online course, but this was in the late 70s, so everything was done by mail. To be clear about that, Ben and Jerry of Ben and Jerry's, two of the biggest names in the industry, weren't ice cream prodigies of a master ice cream maker they didn't start in their parents' ice cream shop at a young age. Their foundation of knowledge came from a $5 correspondence course that they took in their late 20s. They didn't even seem that passionate about it at first. Their initial plan was to make bagels, but ultimately learned that there was less capital required to make ice cream. After they gained at least a basic understanding of the process, the next step was to get some money together and find a location. They were able to pull together $12,000 and were able to obtain a loan for an additional $6,000. And with that $18,000, they were able to convert an old gas station into an ice cream shop. The city they chose was Burlington. 
Burlington, Vermont, primarily because the University of Vermont was there, and they thought that a large population of college students made it a good place to sell ice cream. And that's how Ben & Jerry's existed for the next two years. In 1980, they started supplying local restaurants with their ice cream, and later that year, they rented out an old factory and started producing pints of ice cream to be sold in stores, which is probably how most of us know them today. The next year, they franchised a second location, and you could see how the slow growth was happening here, but this was still a very local brand. Essentially no reach outside of the Burlington, Vermont area. On August 10th, 1981 is when many people from the rest of the country first learned about Ben & Jerry's. This was the cover of Time Magazine, and inside of it was an article that not only mentioned them, but spoke very highly of them. They immediately took advantage of this publicity and began distributing their pints all across the New England area and slowly increased their presence geographically through the rest of the 1980s. By 1985, they were providing ice cream to most of the East Coast. In 1986, they made a deal where a Midwest ice cream company called Dryers started manufacturing and distributing Ben & Jerry's in their markets. By 1988, they were opening their scoop shops outside of the United States. They helped fund all of this expansion through a public stock offering in the mid-80s, and here's what their sales looked like during this time. Obviously growing tremendously every year, and actually doubling year to year through most of it. By the early 90s, their sales were well over 100 million. In April of 2000, Ben & Jerry's, who had been their own company since they started over 20 years earlier, was bought by Unilever. And this is funny, on the exact same day, Unilever also announced that they were acquiring a very different brand called SlimFast. But anyway, the price of Ben & Jerry's ended up being $326 million for the company that had $237 million in sales the year before. It was a bit of a strange deal for multiple reasons, but it said that the Ben & Jerry's team was less concerned with the monetary price and more concerned with creating terms that would help maintain Ben & Jerry's original mission. For example, one of the terms was that Unilever had to continue buying milk from Vermont dairy farmers at above market prices. I guess Unilever even agreed to pay for their legal fees if they failed to live up to this social mission. Despite the unusual conditions, this was an attractive acquisition for Unilever. See, Unilever already owned a lot of other brands that you'd recognize, including other ice cream brands such as, well, Breyers. So when I did that Price is Right comparison in the beginning, it was actually between two brands owned by the same company. Since they already had experience in the ice cream business, they thought that Ben & Jerry's would be a good addition. And consider the fact that at this point, Ben & Jerry's didn't have much of an international presence. So that was a potential opportunity to further grow the brand using their existing distribution channels. Plus, as I said, these super premium brands exist in somewhat of a different market from the traditional brands. So that was their chance to get involved in that. And to this day, Ben & Jerry still operates under Unilever. And I wanna mention one more thing. Ty Warner, he has nothing to do with Ben & Jerry's, but he is the creator of Beanie Babies, another successful business that started from next to nothing. For multiple reasons, the ethicality of Ty Warner is sometimes questioned. When I made a video about him and his business, I asked the viewers what they thought. Was he an unethical person or simply a genius businessman? I got so many responses, similar to Millhouse's over here, essentially saying that the two are the same thing. Saying it's impossible to be a great business person without being unethical. Now, I realize nobody's perfect, but I think Ben & Jerry's is a great answer to that. It shows how to grow a business while maintaining your values. I recommend you go to their website and click on this value section to get a fuller understanding of what they stand for and what they're trying to accomplish, but here's a few responsible, ethical things they've done over the years that stood out to me. Up until 1994, they had the salary cap in place, saying that the highest paid person working for the company couldn't make more than five times the amount of the lowest paid person. So, for example, if there's someone there making $20,000 a year, there's no one there making more than $100,000 a year. In 1985, that public stock offering, in an attempt to help their community, it was only offered to residents of Vermont. Back then, you couldn't buy any Ben & Jerry's stock unless you lived in Vermont. In 1986, they committed that 
10.5% of their pre-tax profits would be donated to their charitable foundation. And that's something that Unilever was forced to continue through the terms of that acquisition. And just consider the terms of that acquisition. Ben and Jerry were more concerned with the new owner continuing things like this than they were with the money that they were receiving. There is some debate surrounding that whole deal and questions regarding whether or not Unilever is carrying out the values to the degree that they should be, but the original Ben and Jerry's company obviously fought for it. All of these things can be seen as hindering to the company's growth. Reinvesting that 7.5% of profits would be more helpful than donating it. If they didn't have that salary cap, maybe they can attract better management, which is actually why they eventually got rid of it. And just consider some of the smaller things, like using cage-free eggs. It all comes at a cost, but in return, they've gained this positive public image. I think Ben & Jerry's is proof that you can grow a business while maintaining a strict set of values. Let me know in the comments, what do you think of Ben & Jerry's? I found the story of these two guys to be inspirational. Unhappy and unsuccessful in their current fields, they decided to make a change. Starting with no experience, no tangible skills, no money, not even a clear vision, yet somehow pulling it all together and making it work. If you had told me about that initial Ben & Jerry's ice cream shop in 1978, I'd probably say it's not likely to succeed. But here we are, over 40 years later, and it's one of the biggest names in the industry. And they did all of it while maintaining their values and keeping a mindset of helping others. Also, what's your favorite flavor? I'm sure it's something crazy. Top flavor of 2018? Half-baked their cookie dough flavor. So any thoughts you have about these two guys, the business they created, or how they did it, leave them in the comments. I'd like to hear what you have to say. Today's sponsor is Audible, which gives me the perfect opportunity to recommend this book called Ben & Jerry's Double Dip Capitalism. It's written and narrated by Ben & Jerry themselves, so it's cool hearing them talk about starting their business. Motivational, really. When I hear them talk about their success story and the thought process behind it, I start getting motivated to create my own. I recommend it to anyone who may need that little push or who just wants to hear these two talk about business. Right now, when you go to audible.com slash company man, you can get this for free, plus Plus, two Audible Originals, which you can't hear anywhere else. Don't like the audiobook you choose? As an Audible member, you can exchange it for up to a year, no questions asked. And this is important, with Audible, you own your books, meaning you keep them even if you cancel your membership. If you're into audiobooks, you should really give this a try. To take advantage of the offer, simply go to audible.com slash companyman or text companyman to 500-500. And if you end up getting that book I recommended, come back and tell me what you thought of it. Thank you for watching.